Good. Good to pray for God's word to be reaching us in our situation. Well, we are in Luke's gospel in chapter six, and we are continuing to look at the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have a Bible, please uh, have it open. Uh, children, uh, you should have uh, some sheets, whether you've got them uh, online or you've got them printed. Be good to have those as we want to all be engaged with learning from God uh, through his word, learning from the Lord, from his beautiful word. So we're thinking this morning about whether we are real keepers, keeping rules, or are we Christ followers? And I'm going to say to you uh, straight away this morning that the most important thing we need to know this morning is that we know Jesus Christ and that it is in him and through him, living contact with him, that we will know good things in our lives. That's what we need to be centered upon, that following Jesus Christ is the most important issue aspect of our lives. The problem is we veer off. We go off in another direction. Some of us purposefully, some of us, well, we just slip into going off in other directions. We start to find that our hope, our Optimism is in other places, but other places can't deliver. Only Jesus is the life bringer. And so in Luke's gospel, we've been discovering how, how the Lord Jesus, he brings so much good. He's going around benefiting people. So he stated, quoted from Isaiah chapter 61, back in chapter 4 and verses 18 and 19, Scan it over on the other page of your Bible. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And we've been discovering since that great declaration that it's not just been words, he's actually been going around and doing it. So from verse 31 of chapter uh, four, there's an unclean demon taken out of a man. And then there's many healed later in the chapter from verse 38 onward. In chapter five, he calls, he calls Peter and the other disciples to a better life. And then we see how a, a leper is cleansed in verse 12 of chapter 5. And a paralytic is healed, verse 17 onwards. And then we see Levi. He's called from his uh, miserable uh, life, his uh, life, his corrupt life in so many ways, into a new life. And so the Lord Jesus has gone about, he's, he's changing things. He's bringing good. He's blessing people. But we've also seen how these other people have shown up, and they are the Pharisees and the scribes. And we saw them in chapter 5 and verse 17, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Initially, they were suspicious, and then they started to get angry with the Lord Jesus. We saw uh, two weeks ago how in verse uh, 33, they were upset because Jesus' disciples were were enjoying themselves and, and they were confused. And we saw how their, the problem was that their religious practices were what they were focusing on and not Jesus Christ. They should have been seeing how their fastings and prayings led to Jesus Christ. And that was a problem because everything focuses in Jesus Christ. And we're going to see this week, similarly with these Pharisees and these teachers of the law, what we're going to see this week, how their problem was focusing on keeping rules, keeping the right, appropriate rules. And it wasn't upon 
going to Jesus Christ and receiving from him. It's just keeping the rules. Now, what are rules? Children, what is a rule? A rule is, is a statement, is as something that is said or written down, which tells us that something should not be done or that something should be done. So at school, for example, you might have a rule that in class you don't speak when the teacher is speaking. That's a rule and you should follow it. Or at home, you might have a rule uh, whereby you are not allowed to hit your brother or your sister. And those are rules and they should be followed. And that is good if we follow them. But the problem, you see, with the Pharisees was they were thinking, we, if we keep these rules, then we are really good people. And then we will be accepted by God because we keep the rules. And we should never think like that because we are only accepted by God through Jesus Christ. Because we all break God's rules. And we need Jesus Christ. We shouldn't be just thinking about how we keep rules, and how good we are, which is really what the Pharisees were doing. But we think about how we need Jesus Christ and to follow him. So just think, we'll, 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 we'll see here as we are, just look at the conclusion of our passage and we'll see what happens to the rule keepers. Verse 11 of chapter 6, we'll see that they were, we almost might say they were miserable and they were mad. We use a phrase, they, they were incandescent with rage. They were really furious that the Lord Jesus wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. And they hated him. They're mad. Whereas those who had received the blessing from the Lord Jesus, in the first verses, verses one to five, they got full tummies. And in the second passage, they've got healed hands. They are rejoicing and ready to serve. Rejoicing and ready to serve. And amidst it all, you've got Jesus, who is Lord of all. Lord of everything. He can set the rules for what can take place on the Sabbath. And he can heal a man of a paralyzed arm. He's Lord of all. So as we come into the passage, we're going to see how there's really a clash, a clash between these rule keepers and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're coming into verses one to five, which I've termed encounter number one. Encounter number one. The Lord Jesus meets with these, uh, with these uh, Pharisees. See what's happening then. It's a Sabbath and uh, the... Uh, the Lord's disciples with the Lord himself are going through a field and they just pluck some of the corn, no doubt feeling hungry and uh, thinking, well, we could have some food and the food was available there. And that was absolutely fine. The Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verses 24 and 25, you could happily just take it as you're walking through and eat it. But the Pharisees were not happy. Verse 2, some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Basically say, that is work. You can't do that. If you're following God, that is not something you can do. You see, they had this rule book. It's as if the true command of God was to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, but they added a whole number of rules as well. 39, in fact, called the Mishnah. And in a sense, the disciples here failed on four accounts. They harvested, they threshed, they winnowed, they prepared, and they really, according to the rules of the Pharisees, had messed it up. You see, the, the Sabbath was a special day given for the people of Israel to be specially prepared for God, but they were to have a proper attitude to it. And these Pharisees had added all of these other rules. 
Now, the Lord Jesus speaks to them, and he speaks to them about what David did. What David did. Now, David, this goes back in verse 4 to uh, chapter, uh, verses 3 and 4. It goes back to uh, Levit uh, 1 Samuel and chapter 21. And there, David was on the uh, run from Saul, and he was hungry, and his men were hungry, and he took some of this special bread, which was only supposed to be for the priests. And that was according to the law. God's law said that in Leviticus in chapter 24 and verses, eight, verses 5 to 9. It says that in God's law. However, David took of that bread and gave it to his followers. It's an interesting thing here, isn't it? There was, in a sense, a, a clash of some truths for David. Was he going to bring blessing and to love those with him and strengthen himself by taking the food? Or was he going to strictly follow that commandment from Leviticus 24? Well, he went and we might say by faith took the bread and he ate it with his followers. I, just to say in passing, this is sometimes what life is about. There are clashes of truths. May I give you uh, one example? You know, if your child is seriously ill uh, and had an accident and he can't get the ambulance there in time and you get your child in the car, what are you to do? Are you to, are you to keep to the speed limits because that's what we should do? Or are you to say, this child's in need, I'm going as quickly as possible? I take it you'd probably do the latter because you believe that's an emergency. And so you just go. Uh, and there's these times when things clash and you just have to say, I'm just going to trust you, God, and do this. And that's what really what David did here. Now, interestingly, as, we sit, as the Lord Jesus is mentioning uh, uh, this, he doesn't say whether David was right or wrong. But the Pharisees... They would obviously hear David and they would say, well, David, obviously he's one of their special men. David wouldn't have done anything wrong. And then he goes into verse 20, verse 5, and the Lord Jesus says to them, directly to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. It's as if he said, they're thinking, he's thinking, they won't say anything wrong about David. Now, will they say anything wrong about me? Will you say anything wrong about me? Will you say that I am wrong in arranging the Sabbath like this so that it's fine for my disciples to take food when they are hungry? Are you going to say anything against that? You see, he then goes a stage further and you says, I am the son of man. And that would tell, take you back to what Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. And uh, this magnificent figure, this son of man figure, who's given dominion and authority and rule over all places and over all ages. This is the one. And this is this godlike figure. Just in passing again, we think sometimes we think of the Son of Man and the Son of God, and one is the deity of the Lord and one is the humanity. It's not quite so straightforward because the Son of Man term is really a declaration that he is the God figure come to earth to do everything to please God. And he is the one who determines how everything should be arranged. He determines what's acceptable. He determines what is acceptable concerning the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is given to bless people, and he is there, happy to see his disciples blessed. And so the Pharisees may have their rules, they may have their arrangements, they may be reasonable based upon the true declaration that we are to honor the Sabbath. But when these rules become everything, they have lost the plot. 
they should have been delighted to see blessing. Hungry man being fed. So which is better? Which is better? Keeping the rules or leaving people hungry? Sorry, which is better? Keeping the rules and leaving people hungry or following the Lord and being blessed? I take it. It is the latter. We follow the Lord and we bring a blessing. The Lord wants people to be blessed on his day. And always, it's a general principle. He's bringing blessing, you see. Therefore, we should be looking to follow the one who brings a blessing. Just to, just to push this a bit further, you see, what happens with, with people who are of this this, this, um, this spirit where it, whereby they keep rules is their fault finders as well. They're always looking to find fault. I remember some years ago, uh, a, a good believing man coming into uh, our own home and he picked up uh, one of our newspapers, uh, the Evangelical Times, I believe, believe it was. And it was as if he was picking it up to, to see where he could find fault with it, to see what was wrong with it. And this spirit is not a pleasant spirit to have. The Lord Jesus is the one who is Lord of all, and he is the one who is delighting to bring blessing. And so should we be. We should be blessing lovers. So that's the first encounter. Let's go to encounter number two, which is in verses 6 to 11. We're on the Sabbath again. It says in, uh, in verse uh, verse six, it's another Sabbath. And the Lord Jesus is in the synagogue and he is doing some teaching. And notice straight away, he's doing good things again. He's bringing blessing to people. He's teaching them that which would strengthen them uh, to be in God's way. The Pharisees are there again with the scribes. And there's a man there, whether he's been brought in by the Pharisees and scribes as a, just to test the Lord Jesus, we don't know. But he's there and he's got a paralyzed arm. His arm won't, uh, his arm won't work uh, properly. And you see, the Pharisees, they basically said that if there is a, if, if sort of, we might say, medical work is done, healing work is done, on the Sabbath day, according to them, that was work. So you can't do it. And so they're thinking, is he going to do something? And so there's a tension here. And the Lord Jesus, he builds up the tension as we come into uh, verse 8. He knows what's in their thoughts. So he says to the man, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. So there's no doubt. Right in the center of things is this man. Okay. He's the center of the whole undertaking. And the Lord Jesus then, he is, he is uh, going to draw the matter to the fullest, starkest understanding of what's going on and the attitude of these Pharisees. He's basically going to challenge them. Are you interested just in keeping your rules or are you interested in blessing and bringing good happenings to this man? So we see there in verse nine, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? Basically he's saying, if you're keeping the rules, your rules, you're just going to harm this man. You're going to keep him in his misery. But I'm here for the best welfare of this man. I am here to do good. And he heals him. And he blesses him. Verse 10. And after looking around at them all, sense of theater here, looks around, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored. That withered hand and now becomes strong. Uh, just notice here, 
that there was nothing that could be considered in any way to be work in what the Lord Jesus did. He didn't even reach out to him. He just said, and it happened. Alas, verse 11, we say, but they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. I was so angry. This man has come along. This man is saying that he is Lord of all. And he's showing that he's Lord of all, but he's not following our rules. And if he's not following our rules, whoever he is, we are going to hate him. We are going to want to do away with him. The Lord Jesus, on the other hand, he's set on loving people. He's set on bringing blessing uh, to people. That is his ministry. Overall, it is his ministry. And that is significant for us as well, because we can know that when we are following him and following in his way, connected with him, we're going to be following in a way of blessing. And we would want to follow his way by being a blessing to others, to flow with good things to others. You see, there's just a big danger in focusing on rule keeping. We need to remember that our focus should be upon Jesus Christ. Now, as we come to conclusion, I want to, I want to just draw our attention uh, to certain thoughts here. I'm going to draw our content, attention to certain thoughts. Several things that I want to be mentioned as we come to think this through a little bit further. The first thing we will think about is, as we are concluding here, that keeping rules for the sake of keeping rules so that you can boost yourself by keeping the rules leads to misery. They're in a miserable state at the end, these Pharisees, and there's no joy in it. Now, let's think then about how that can be for ourselves. We can, it can happen in churches, for example. It can, it can happen with regard to certain uh, attitudes. You can have a certain, you, you can have a certain dress code, for example, that if you dress in a certain way, then that is keeping the rules. If you don't, follow those rules, then it's no good. Or you can say, well, you can't go to certain places. Yeah, you can't go to pubs. You're not allowed to go to a pub. And you make that a rule. And you, they say, I won't go to pubs. I dress in a certain way. Therefore, I am doing what is good and God's going to be happy with me. And you get into a, a way of just keeping the rules. No, it's good to dress in an appropriate way. And uh, it's, it, you can conclude that it's, it's not good to go to a pub. But these things are, if you start making them rules, they, they, uh, and that just grows. You see, that's what happens with the Pharisees. They started with a good rule, which is you shouldn't work on a Sabbath. And they start adding the rules. And it's sort of, a, it, it, it's, a, it's a miserable spirit that, that develops as a result of that. There's no joy in it. Joy is in Christ. Okay. The second thing uh, as regards to the, the conclusion here is the rule, rule keepers are generally always thinking about how they can divide. They, they keep their rules and therefore these rules would, make, would mark them off from other people make them feel superior for example so you can end up uh, with churches you might say uh, churches that uh, well they say we're a church where no one drinks alcohol yeah and it can be a good 
conclusion to reach that you won't drink alcohol, but to say that that's the rule and this is what our church is, is just a dividing thing. Similarly, we could say that, oh, we have a certain uh, hard uh, 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 rules as regards to what can be done on our Lord's Day, on our equivalent of the Sabbath. And we can say, well, that's what we do. And if you don't agree with it, you have to stay away. And we start to arrange ourselves in a dividing way, in a dividing way. We're looking how we can divide from people. And that is not good. We should be looking to how we unite in Christ with fellow Christians. Yes, there are times when we have to divide because there are certain key issues of doctrine and moral conduct. But our spirit should not be a fault-finding, dividing spirit. So are we going to say, as we move to a point three of these comments I want to make finally, that it's no, you don't have to keep any rules? You just finish with any rules. No, we're not. We're not, to use the phrase, we're not antinomian, to use the wrong word, the long word. We are those who want to keep the commandments of God because we love our Savior. Keeping the commandments of God does not make us acceptable with God. But because we are accepted by God in Christ, we want to keep his commandments. We want to do what pleases him. So the Lord Jesus would say in John's gospel in chapter 14 and verse 21, verse 15 rather, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what we would delight to do. We delight in the law of God because we realize it shows us our God and we want to live to please him. So we don't keep the law of God or walk in the way that it is the true way in order to say, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a really top class Christian, better than all those others who are still struggling at 30 percent in terms of achieving the rules. I'm further up. Not at all. It's just out of humble devotion to our savior, this one who has brought blessing into our lives that we want to go forward and to please him. Can I say as well, fourthly, in these concluding comments, connecting with the Lord Jesus Christ always is for our good. Think of those disciples as they went through that field. Was it good that they were with the Lord Jesus, who was happy for them to fill their tummies and to enjoy some food? They were blessed. He is happy for them to be blessed. The man with the withered hand, he was, he was wanting him to be blessed. Now, if you're, if you're connecting in here, uh, please, and thinking about Christianity, I just simply want to say this. It's always going to be for your good to connect with Jesus Christ. It's always going to transform you in a good direction. You might be thinking, well, I've got to give up this. I've got to give up that. Or it's going to change this. It's going to change that. It's only going to be for the better. You know, giving up to receive from Jesus is always the wise thing to do. Leaving behind what is of this world and embracing Jesus is always the best thing to do. You see, I just say connect with Jesus Christ. Your sin is stopping you from connecting with Jesus Christ. Well, repent of your sin. Be finished with your sin and go to Jesus Christ who, who died on the cross to take away your sins and connect with him by faith, revealing, believing in what he did. He's alive now from the dead. This is Jesus Christ and he is the Lord and he's in control of all. And he is, he is this great son of man figure. He wants to bring blessing. And fellow Christians, if you've drifted away from this, let's run back to Christ and just enjoy him as the one who blesses us so richly. Uh, can I say then, fifthly, in these comments, is your life then an attractive life? Or is it a, a rule-keeping, miserable, perhaps even proud life, which is not attractive to anybody, 
and they just think, well, I don't want any of that. Or is it, well, we thought about it in our Bible study last Wednesday about what was ha happening in Acts chapter 2, how the, the people around were impressed. It says that they were, they were the people who had come to Jesus Christ and known his blessing, they were having favor with all the people. All the people were, were, were seeing there's something good about what these people are doing. Now, people, they may not... Uh, as it were, uh, approve of uh, your, your change, but they should see that there is something attractive about our lives, that we have something through the blessing of God, which makes us not just uh, not miserable and not just going this way, not just following the way of this world with all of its turbulence and disturbance, but we have the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Which way are we? Do we have an attractive Christianity? Do people who come to Feltham Evangelical Church find our faith attractive? Number six, then, as these final concluding comments. I've got eight of them, so nearly finished these concluding comments. We'll bring it to our Sunday, our Lord's Day, our equivalent of the Sabbath. Do we honor our Lord's Day so as to keep the rules or to love Christ more and to enjoy more of his blessing? On the Lord's Day today, am I, am I engaging with this day because, well, I can't do this and I can't do that and I, I shouldn't go here and I shouldn't go there and I shouldn't. Or are we simply say, I just want to know you better and enjoy your goodness today, Lord. So I, I, I'm, just, I'm just withdrawing from my normal things. And I just want to know you and your blessing, Lord. Let's be thoughtful about that. And that uh, continues in, in verse 7. Are we committed to bringing the blessing on the Lord's day ourselves? Are we continuing to bless? Are we... Are we engaging in the Lord's day with a desire to bring blessing, bring good things into people's lives? Or are we saying, well, I uh, can't do hospitality. I can't welcome anybody to uh, uh, my home. I know that's difficult at the moment because of all, all the circumstances that we're in. But a general principle, I won't do hospitality on, because that's work. Or I, I won't engage in evangelism. We can't do evangelism because uh, that'll be work. And the opportunity to bless people through evangelism and hospitality is lost because we've, we've started to create these, these sort of rules. I know we've got to be careful that we don't, as it were, just get overwhelmed on the Lord's Day by activities. But let's be thinking about how we can bring blessing. And so finally, in number eight, it's the Lord who brings blessing lord jesus alone if we get nothing else from this message just to focus on him re-engage with him see him for who he is you know rule keeping can be quite attractive because it uh, it's easy to monitor you know you've tick tick done that done that done that and yeah we can lose the whole point of what life is about Life is to have a living relationship with the one who brings blessing. He really does bring blessing. Gabriella next week is going to confess at this time how she has received blessing from turning from her sin and turning to Jesus. When we have the Lord Jesus, we're walking, we're coming into the one who brings blessing. You see, rule keeping in the end leads to misery. But true faith and living for Christ connects us to the one who, who brings joy. You see, going back to our passage, you see, these people with a full tummy now, verses one to five, and a heel hand, what are they? They are now improved to be for the Lord. They are set for joyful service. They are there set to be able to go forward to serve the Lord and bring blessing to others. And so 
as for ourselves, when we connect with this one who is the one who delights to bring good things into those who would be following him, we would want to be those who want to bring good things to others. Think about how you can do good things this week for others. You can send a text, write a letter even, um, make a phone call to encourage somebody. Well, that'll be a blessing to so many at this time. Perhaps there's some who on their own at this time and they don't get to hear from anybody how much joy and blessing you could give simply by making that contact. And as we venture into this Christmas season with all of its uh, all of its difference to normal, let's be thinking, well, how can we bless people? Yeah, How can we work through all of the complexities of the arrangements and uh, requirements? And how can we work through that? Yeah, so that we, we can really bless people and bring good things into people's lives. We need to just really be thinking about what somebody needs and how we can bless people and help people. So those are some concluding thoughts. I really want us to think through this whole issue that are we those who just wanna keep rules, which happens in so many churches, happens in so many lives, particularly for those who are religious, the whole world is full of religions that are just about keeping the rules. Christ is about, Christianity is about a living relationship with the one who delights to do good and to benefit our lives, that we might be better. Oh, how good it is to know the Son of Man, who is Lord of the Sabbath, and he is Lord of all, and he always is working to bring good. May we embrace him, and dare we say, Feel the flowings of his blessings upon our beings, into our lives and out of our lives. Oh, I just encourage you into these ways for the glory of our God. And as we come to our final hymn, we'll just realize it, it's, it's, it's not ourselves that can be involved in bringing blessing. It's all to do with our Lord and connecting uh, with him. Oh, so let's sing our final hymn together this morning. And uh, let's say, uh, feel free to sing out loud at home and uh, appreciate your Savior. Let's sing our final
May we all be strengthened now to go forward, um, that we would hold, know that we are going, that we are, we are rejoicing in our God by the Spirit, glorying in Christ Jesus and not putting confidence in the flesh. Now, please stay around. Uh, there'll be breakout groups uh, uh, after the service. Uh, so if you want to join together, be great to chat with others. Uh, so please stay behind. If you need to get off, there's no problem. Uh, the Lord bless you into this uh, Lord's Day. We meet together tonight uh, to continue our day together. And tonight we're going to just be embracing God's purpose in one book of the Bible, uh, the book of Ezra. So come along and see what we can discuss.